Okay, off and running. <clears throat> of course, now that we have a nicer day where it's not so dang cold out, and it seems to induce some laziness, but we'll just see how that goes. <clears throat> okay, now, um, Um, I haven't forgotten the okay, I just realized oh yeah the um, due date for, for the first quiz was some time ago and I know that I have a bunch of those still left to do it looks like we have okay I've, I've nine but I haven't graded I've graded a few um, so I will do those soon the uh, first regular homework assignment coming up due on Wednesday, so I'm sure to take some time uh, with uh, questions on that. Um, I know several of you have turned it in already, um, and I will uh, um, okay. Right. Um, okay. Um, So I'm, wait, I'm waiting until the due date passes before I actually uh, start looking at them. So, um, so I'm trying to, uh, so off the top of my head, uh, I'm certain from having these kind of assignments turned in in previous semesters. Okay, so now there's only one undergrad unaccounted for. Oh, I know who it is. Uh, Will. Will's not here. So, okay. Um, uh when I was in, in you know, 460, 560, when grading assignments there, there are certain annoyances that came about. Um, so uh, for, now if, if you have, if you already turned in the first assignment, um, that, that, that's, that's okay. But something to keep in mind for the several other ones that are yet to come. Okay. Um, I'll add these to the top of these notes. So if I have any, like, general announcements, I'll put them up here. Okay. All right, so for a homework uh, submission, um, okay. Uh, first, uh, please don't use subfolders. Uh, like, if you're packing up all your files, like, you know, your .m files uh, or any diaries or anything like that. Um, I don't want to see some hierarchy. You know, what, what I like to do is, um, and I'll, I'll give an example from, uh, from last semester because it's pretty much the same deal. Oh, oh the doors are drifting open, so, okay. <laughs> uh, like, so for instance, I'll create a folder, say, for homework one, um, and then I just create a folder for everybody, so several of you will recognize your names up here from, from last semester. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so by going to yours, <laughs> and then here are all the files, that was a pretty big assignment, <laughs> so, um, which is generally not going to be the case this semester. Um, so I just like to have all these out and, and just look look through them um, and uh, so having 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 a uh, having to dig through subfolders to get to what I want um, it just complicates that process. I do like to just go through all the files um, and just open one after another and grade the problem that's associated with that uh, file. Uh, so that's that's one thing. So so just have a flat hierarchy of whatever folders uh, whatever whatever files you have. Um, Okay, I'll start a list here. Whoops. Okay. Oh, and the editor's not cooperating. Okay. Okay. 
Um, all right, another is uh, for um, MATLAB functions. Please use exactly the same interface as in the uh, problem. So to give you an example of that, uh, so I'll pick out one of the problems from this uh, first homework. Okay. Okay, uh, this one right here. So I want to be able to call the function exactly like that. Uh, exact same name, case sensitive. So, uh, so notice I tend to make of uh, functions all lowercase uh, function names. So stick with that, and at least the same number of arguments. I mean, I don't care what the arguments are called in your file, but here this function accepts two inputs, returns two outputs. Um, so don't be any extra things. Um, so, um, so, so functions may be graded. Uh, by script, uh, so I'm, I can and I actually did this in in 46560 and for certain assignments, I would write a script that would uh, go into a fol folder of all your files. So another reason not to have subfolders, just look for a file in there, um, and go ahead and run it. And if a file is not found for whatever reason, it like you didn't submit it or you did submit it but under a different name, it's just going to say not found, and try to give you no points. And then I have to go in there and check and see what went wrong, which makes grading take longer, which take, puts me in a bad mood. And you want me to be in good mood while grading. <laughs> so, um, so anything that streamlines a process um, helps. Um, and because um, because yes, grading these things is a pain. Um, and that's why I try to assign a minimum number of problems to still get decent coverage, but um, trying to re reduce the team a little bit. Um, trying to think of what else there was. Um, okay. Um, make it easy to see which problem your work is for, and the uh, final result. So don't don't make me hunt. If there's, if there's some particular thing. That's both meant to be a final result. Make it easy to find that. Go ahead and box it if it's written on paper, you know uh, that sort of thing. Um, okay. Another is uh, zip files preferred. Um, what happens sometimes when, when someone does? Uh, it didn't really come up in this assignment, I don't think, but on other ones where there's some problems that are worked out on paper, um, and uh, depending on how you send them to me, sometimes it takes the image that you scanned of your work, paperwork and embeds it in the email like it's, it's not an attachment. Um, so then, I, so then it makes it harder to save that with your other files and uh, go for your assignment. So if you just take everything that you ha are sending me, M files, uh, um, work scanned on papers, images, all that stuff, whatever you have, or if you do it a, a PDF. Um, you know, what, just go ahead and put it in one zip file and just send me that zip file. Um, that'll because it's, it's, it's actually kind of a, a pain to get all your assignments from email into a, 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 a right place on my computer so that I can go through and grade it. So anything that cuts down on that time um, uh, is a good thing. Okay. Um, Well, if I am leaving something out, it'll probably come up with a first assignment, so I can nag you about it before the second. Um, we'll just uh, see how it goes. But, um, but these are the main annoyances that I recall from uh, from last semester. So now you know. <clears throat> and no, I'm not going to be like some professors out there that expect things a certain way, and if they and if, you, and if it isn't that way, then you know, start hacking off points like crazy. I'm, uh, I'm not going to be that professor, <laughs> but um, it's, it's, it's still going to frustrate me. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for, we have some 
Uh, so it requires what? Requires answers. Yeah. For instance, um, three, one, three. Three, one, three. Okay. Yeah. So it says I'm in the fields of point of creation. Yeah. So do we include that in the script or do we separate? Um, okay. The, um, I'll address that here. So, if uh, a problem involves both MATLAB code and questions, um, is the easiest thing to do is to uh, include the answers to questions as uh, comments. Um, whatever MATLAB file. So, like for this problem, you're asked to write a script. So you are going to be submitting an M file for that. Um, so you go ahead and include as a comment in that script uh, the, the answer to that question. So what are we putting maybe together with the PDF or the assignment that I'm not Oh, oh, I'm sorry. What? Uh, so what if because for this now there's some assignments that I'm not that we're just going to solve. Okay, like on like on paper. Yeah. So what are we including such being that like exploration three one? Um. Yeah. Um. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So so you just go ahead and write like exploration or just write a, a problem number, but you know three one four or whatever. Um. Uh, yeah. Th that way at least that'll be enough for me to navigate. Um. Uh. uh so. Um. I guess I'm not sure what you're asking. Yeah. The reason why I'm asking is like remember one of these scripts from last semester we have an song. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I included the value for n in the separate PDF file. Okay, I, I mean, it, it, it seems like you didn't see, so you would assign grade for that class. Oh, um, well, okay, if, if I forgot to grade something, you gotta tell me. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, it was insignificant, so I. Well, well, yeah, well, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I remember from that problem, it seemed like there are certain cases where I could, I didn't, I, it just wasn't apparent to me what the answer uh, for that part was, like how many sub intervals. Like I saw the code, um, yeah, so, and so, um, so, so sorry about it if I overlooked it. <laughs> so, um, and yes, out of curiosity, later I am going to go look at that. <laughs> but um, uh, now, um, I. As long as I can, as long as it's not hard for me to find it, uh, like, like for instance, if you're going to be including um, all kinds of work scanned like from paper, um, then I'll certainly find it there, presumably. <laughs> so, so that that's fine too. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is for the second assignment. Went too far. Okay. Um, well, I okay. This is this is not um, necessarily MATLAB work at all. Uh, well, okay. You can do it either way. Um, so um, because this is something I, I I actually intended that it be carried out on paper, but if you're willing to write the code to do it and carry out the appropriate uh, row operations with um, and carrying out the pivoting, um, that's fine too. I'm just wondering whether I have to write that over and over or else I can just do equals. Oh, uh, um, okay. Well, as, as long as I can tell what happens with each row operation. Because um, that way, if, if the final result is not correct, then I can go back and say, okay, this operation was wrong. Uh, so so what, whatever shows me what he did. And then if you ever oh, you ask about this one too, uh, okay, it's the same kind of problem, just a different pivoting scheme. Um, so also intended to be done on paper, but I, I won't object to you actually <laughs> writing a code that would do the same thing. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, 
Other questions related to homework submission. Okay, so these are just things to help move a process along and um, hopefully make it less painful all the way around. Okay. Um, shoot, there was. Uh, dang it. While, we, while this question came up, there was something else that came to mind. It just flew out of my head. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so when an assignment is graded, um, okay. So feedback on problems will be uh, entered as a comment in the Canvas uh, gradebook. So what will happen is uh, once the homework is uh, completely graded, um, I'll enter all the scores in Canvas. Um, so when I type your score into the gradebook, there's a little thing I click to enter a comment. I'm just going to copy and paste the comments, which would show like the individual deductions, uh, which problem, how much, why there was a deduction, um, just so you know where all the point losses came from. Um, and so if need be, you, you, uh, you can ask me about it. So certainly if, if, uh, if I say, oh, this problem or this part of a problem wasn't submitted, and it was, uh, then uh, you can see why the points are taken off and, and then clear that up so I can go ahead and correct it. <clears throat> okay. Now, back to LUD composition. So continuing with 3.2. So this is where I left off last time. Um, so how AX equals B is solved when you're using the LED composition. Um, so you carry out gas elimination, but only on A. We do not form the augmented matrix anymore. That's a math free 26 anachronism. Um, so gas elimination, reducing A to a row echelon form produces U. And then all the multipliers used in the row operations um, are stored in the lower triangular part of L. And this is the most expensive part. Actually, I'm going to rewrite this so it's not so ambiguous. Um, yeah, two-thirds n cubed. The way I read before, one might think that the n cubed was in the denominator. It is definitely not. Um, so that's the most expensive part of solving AX equals B. Once we have the L and U factors, uh, L is lower triangular. So we solve this system using forward substitution uh, to get the vector Y, which is the right-hand side of this system. Um, y is a vector that you would get from applying a row operations to B. Um, and uh, so then we solve this system using back substitution, and then we have X. Um, now, at this point, the way I described it, it seems like you can just take any matrix A and go ahead and uh, perform Gauss elimination on it and compute and obtain the uh, LUD composition. But in fact, that is not necessarily the case. Okay. So, not every matrix, even if invertible, has a LU decomposition. So um, existence is not necessarily assured. So I'm going to give uh, an example. Um, Actually, I'm going to give two. Okay. Um,
Okay, so this matrix does not have an LUD composition, um, and this matrix does not either. Um, Okay, so neither one of these uh, has one. Um, now, um, so what goes wrong? If we were to actually try to carry out um, Gaussian elimination, so if I pull up the algorithm for that, okay, so this is a Gaussian elimination algorithm. So if you keep in mind that the uh, way Gaussian elimination works is we proceed from left to right, so starting from the first column towards the end, um, and then for each column, we try to eliminate the non-zero entries plus you below the diagonal, and for that we need a multiplier. And what is a multiplier? The multiplier is the entry you're trying to eliminate divided by the bless you, diagonal entry in that same column. So with this in mind, what goes wrong, what's the problem with the first matrix that prevents us from performing Gaussian elimination? Yeah, this diagonal entry, the 1-1 one, one entry um, is 0. So in first A, All right, um, so, uh, so, so, so that ends it for this matrix. Now, for the second matrix, we don't have that problem. We can go ahead and work on the uh, first column. So for second A, we can proceed with first column and using these multipliers. So we need to eliminate the 2, 1 entry. So it's going to be uh, 2 divided by the diagonal entry. Um, and then the 3, 1 entry. So that's going to be the entry we're trying to eliminate, which is a 3, divided by the diagonal entry. So in other words, we're going to uh, take um, 2 times the first row and subtract it from row 2, 3 times the first row and subtract it from uh, row 3. Now, uh, I don't trust myself to do this off the top of my head right now, and I thought you might find it instructive to show how this would be done in MATLAB anyway, so that's what I'll do. So I'll go ahead and type in this matrix. So 1, 2, minus 7, 2, 4, 1, 3, 0, minus 5. Okay, um, so I'm going to create a matrix that is a um, product of elementary row matrices for performing these operations. So I have identity, but in the second row, first column, I'll put minus the multiplier, so that'd be minus 2. And then in the third row, first column, I'll put in minus this multiplier, so minus 3. Okay. <clears throat> so this matrix times A will carry out those row operations. So it'll um, set the second row equal to itself minus twice the first row. Third row will be itself minus 3 times the first row. So E equals M times A. Okay, so it did the job in the first column. It eliminated the entries below the diagonal. And then what went wrong? You have a 2-2 two, two entry is 0 after performing those row operations. Um, okay. 
a2, 2 equals 0 in the updated um, matrix. So it was not obvious um, from here that uh, the, like, the original matrix that this was going to happen. Although I did contrive this matrix so that it would. Um, so, um, so, that, so now I can state for you the uh, condition for which we know that the LUD composition will exist. Um, and then I'll give you an idea, then you'll see how I was able to concoct this example um, for which it would not. So the LUD composition of U exists if and only if um, the principal minors stop it of A are non-zero. So what are those? Um, so I need to define a couple of terms for you. The leading principal principal submatrices <coughs> um, by the way, one pet peeve I have is when people mix up the spellings of principal, so A L versus L E. Um, it's almost always A L. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> sorry, my spelling tip for today. Um, of A uh, consists of um, okay. All right, so I'm going to label these. Um, whoops. I'll call it A1, A2, up to A N. Okay. Something weird's going on here. Okay. So A1 is equal to A11. So just that one one entry. Um, A2 consists of alright, so it's the upper left 2x2 two two block um, so in general AK is defined to be the upper left k by k uh, block. Um, Okay, so let me fill in a little bit more here. Okay, so so, so, you, so you start at the upper left from A11, take a K by K submatrix, and that is uh, AK. So those are called the leading principal submatrices. So the principal minors. of A are but their determinants. Okay. 
Okay. So in other words, we're assuming that the matrix A is invertible. So that would be the leading principle submatrix AN, the whole matrix. Uh, so that determinant has to be non-zero. But it's not enough for A itself to be invertible. These leading principal submatrices have to be invertible also. Um, the composition to exist. All right. Um, so certainly, if A11 is zero, that's the first principal submatrix, therefore this is the first principal minor, um, then game over. But this matrix right here did not have that problem. So what I did was I made sure that this two by two submatrix, one, four, two, two, if you take the determinant of this matrix, so you get one times four minus two times two is zero. So I just set that up to be a singular matrix. Um, so I knew that for this one, A1 would be non-zero, um, the first principal minor would be non-zero, but the uh, second one would be zero. Okay. Um, so, uh, all right. So that's how we, how we know that the LED composition exists at least. Um, unfortunately, not an easy thing to check um, because um, <clears throat> uh, because you're, you're computing a whole bunch of determinants and determinants are generally expensive to compute. Um, now, if it exists, Is it unique? Um, well, let's find out. So we assume that here's the LUD composition of A and a second LUD composition of A. All right. So, uh, so we can try to show that these have to be equal. Um, now, um, so because A is non -sing is in non singular or invertible, um, then but these factors L one L two U one U two are also non singular. Why? Because remember, the determinant of a product is a product of a determinant. Um, if uh, if the determinant of either one of these was zero, the determinant of A would be zero also, and A would not be invertible. Um, okay. So that means we can actually work with the inverses of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, multiply both sides on the left by L1 inverse. So I'm canceling with the U1 on the left. Um, L1 inverse, L2, U2. Um, but then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides on the right by uh, U2 inverse. So because we know everything here is invertible, um, then there's no problem with making this kind of rearrangement, working with both of these inverses. <clears throat> now, multiplying and inverting preserves triangularity. The inverse of an upper triangular matrix is upper triangular. Um, same, with, same with lower. Um, the product of two upper triangular matrices um, is upper triangular and similar for lower. So we can conclude that U1, U2 inverse is upper triangular and L1 inverse, L2, is 
not just lower triangular unit lower triangular. Um, so that property L, L is the L the LU decomposition is the unit lower triangular matrix. In other words, all the diagonal entries are one. So if you invert that, it's still unit lower triangular. If you multiply them, still unit lower triangular. But the thing is, these matrices are equal. So um, so what can we say, or what can we conclude if a lower triangular and upper triangular are equal? And if a matrix is both lower and upper triangular, what does the matrix look like? What kind of structure does it have? Yes, it has to be a diagonal matrix. Because all entries below the diagonal, the main diagonal, must be zero. That's due to upper triangular, uh, upper triangularity, and all entries above the main diagonal also have to be zero due to lower triangularity. Okay. All right. So, um, so let's take a look on the right side here. This matrix is uh, not just diagonal, but the diagonal entries are equal to 1. Because L1 inverse L2 is a uh, unit lower triangular. So if we have a matrix that is a diagonal matrix, but all the diagonal entries must be one, what matrix is that? What? It must be an identity matrix. So L1 inverse L2 is equal to identity, that should be uppercase I, so now what you can do is multiply both sides on the left by L1 inverse and conclude that L1 and L2 must be equal. Um, and because this U1, U2 inverse also is equal to identity, you can conclude that they're equal to, to each other. So that proves that the LUD composition actually is unique when it does exist. <clears throat> I had to make sure I did not assign it as a homework problem before I worked it out. <clears throat> so questions about how this proof proceeded. So it's really just all about taking advantage of the properties that um, uh, that lower and upper and that's also unit lower triangular matrices are uh, are known to have. All right. Now. Because the LUD composition does not always exist, um, we want to be able to use the LUD composition um, for any invertible matrix, whether A by itself, as given to us, has an LUD composition. And that gets into a row interchanges. Uh, so even if A, as given, um, does not have an LUD composition, some rearrangement of the rows of A, um, we can as long as A is invertible, we can make sure that does have 
subject decomposition. That's something we'll get into shortly, but first I'll talk about determinants um, real quick. Um, so assuming the LU decomposition does exist, once you have it, it takes a lot of work to get it, but it can be used to easily obtain the determinant uh, of a matrix. Because, as I mentioned earlier, the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. Um, and the determinant of a triangular matrix, upper or lower, is particularly easy to get. It's just a product of a diagonal entries. And for L, all the diagonal entries are one. So we can forget about L. And U being upper triangular, the determinant is just a product of the uh, uh, diagonal entries. Um, So the determinant of A is just going to be the product of the diagonal entries of U. Okay. Um, now, if you remember, maybe in a first linear algebra course, or I remember actually doing this in high school too, uh, how to compute the determinant of a matrix it's the, the, using the definition. Um, that's where you, like, you go across the first row and you uh, compute the, um, it's called the cofactors, or whatever it is. Um, you still have purely in algebra terms, but I no longer have interest in. Uh, so, um, so you compute, you del like, delete the first row and column, compute determinant of that matrix, then you move to the second row, delete the first row and second column, compute determinant of that, and you have to alternate in signs and add all these up. Um, so computing a definition... Um, using, sorry, not computing the de determinant, using the definition requires n factorial floating point operations. Because compute the determinant of the n by n matrix, you have a compute determinant of n matrices of size n minus 1. Um, so in other words, the, whatever work was involved with that, for a problem of size n minus 1, but you got to multiply that amount of work by n. So if you solve that recurrence relation, the total number of operations is on the order of n factorial, which is, explodes very quickly. Um, um, whereas using the LU decomposition requires only um, two-thirds n cubed, um, plus some lower order terms. But um, so, and I say only, I put only in quotes because an algorithm requires order n cubed operations. That's still not great by any means. Uh, we, we, we try to get something better than that whenever we can. But uh, compared to n factorial, um, that's, that's, that's definitely a bargain. Okay. Now, somewhere in here, I have a LaTeX error. Okay, it's been fixed. Okay. Um, the thing is, so determinants, like, um, I remember in like an ordinary linear algebra class spending quite a bit of time on determinants. Um, and uh, actually, the graduate level, pure linear algebra classes also, it, it seemed like we'd spend weeks on them. It was crazy. Um, numerical linear algebra determinants are not really of the utmost importance. Uh, and once in a while, they, they do come in handy. Um, but it, it's not something that gets the same kind of attention in numerical linear algebra as it does just in ordinary uh, uh, linear algebra. Um, now, like, like for example, um, uh, Okay, so so 
So why are determinants not as important in numerical linear algebra? Now, can anyone tell me, and there's more than one right answer, I just want to see if anybody picks out the right the one I'm looking for to make my point. Um, what's the determinant useful for? What? Um, well, it plays a very small role in the formula for the inverse, yes. Um, but what? Uh, go ahead, what? Yes, singular versus non-singular. So, um, so we know that A is non-singular if and only if the determinant is non-zero. But um, Q of minus, we have round-off error to uh, um, to contend with. Suppose you compute the determinant of a matrix. And you find that the number of it you get from floating point arithmetic is really small. It's not exactly zero. You can almost never expect to get exactly zero. Maybe it's like 10 to the minus 10, something like that. Um, so the problem is um, it is possible for a matrix to be near a singular matrix. Uh, so in other words, a small change in the entries makes it singular. While well, the determinant is nowhere near zero. So like I, I can make a matrix whose determinant is one. Um, so a number not near zero in any meaningful sense. Um, but you tweak the matrix just a little bit and it goes singular. Um, Similarly, a matrix um, could have a tiny determinant, but would not be anywhere near singular. So in other words, the determinant is not, in a floating point arithmetic sense, is not a useful measure of singularity. Because if it is exactly zero, yes, you know the matrix is singular. But we like to have a notion of uh, checking for singularity where, OK, if it's zero, the matrix is singular. If it's nearly zero, the matrix should be nearly singular. So in other words, we need to measure if it's basically a continuous function of the uh, entries of a matrix uh, because of round off error. Uh, we don't want a situation where a tiny change in the input causes a large change in the output. Um, so in other words, I could have a matrix that is singular, its determinant is zero, and I make a small change to a matrix and its determinant becomes large. And that's something that just isn't helpful for a practical computation. Uh, so it can make a small change in A to cause a large change in the determinant of A. So in other words, it's like an ill-conditioned function of the uh, matrix entries. So um, now something I'll come to later, um, the, uh, it's called the, the, I won't make a big deal about it in this class, but it's worth mentioning, the singular value decomposition uh, gives you the singular values of a matrix. And the smallest singular value of A is a useful like geometric measure of uh, distance to a singular matrix. And so like a determinant, if it's zero, the matrix is singular. Uh, but if it's small, then yes, you could say A is nearly singular. Um, and uh, this is often why I refer to a um, non-invertible matrix as a singular matrix. It relates to the singular values. Um, my, my advisor, Gene Golub, he developed the algorithm for computing the singular value uh, decompositions. That's what he was known for. He was uh, Professor SVD. In fact, he even said that on his license plate. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So that's, so that's why determinants don't really play much of a role 
in numerical linear algebra uh, because of our ill-conditioned nature. Okay. Um, let's see where we're at in this section here. Pivot in. One, two, three, four. Okay. Um, all right, I think we're at uh, a good point of section where I can leave the rest of this section for uh, Wednesday. Um, we have 20 something minutes left. So, uh, so if anyone has any homework questions, then we certainly have, have time for that. Oh, silly me. <laughs> Even though this happens to me almost every time, <laughs> Although now and then, especially you know this class or continuation from last semester, you guys do have some questions now and then. Um, <laughs> hmm. hmm. Not a single one. The homework is easy. <laughs> Why well, not? Several of you turned it in already, and then it's probably it's way too soon to start the next one. So, okay, okay. All right, I will start talking about pivoting. Um, so I can pressure myself to get through the whole thing because that's pretty much the rest of the section. Okay. Oh, or maybe I shouldn't. Okay. Yeah, I could stay in pivoting. <laughs> Okay, now, um, so if the LU decomposition does not exist, um, then we must certainly perform row operations. Um, a row interchanges. I'm sure that it does. Um, but um, due to floating point er arithmetic error, we have another reason to perform row interchanges. So so a big difference between working out these kind of problems on paper versus on computer. On paper, if you're trying to perform Gaussian elimination and you're carrying out the algorithm like as, as has been described, where you go systematically through the columns, column one, column two, etc., then yeah, you would find that if you're doing all this in paper and exact arithmetic or using your know, fractions or whatever, then what would happen is um, at some point you might be faced with dividing by zero. In that case, you have to perform a uh, row interchange. Um, but when it's floating point arithmetic, you can have a matrix for which the LU decomposition exists, and it's still a good idea to uh, perform uh, row interchanges. So, and attending to this will naturally get around. The issue of like, what if you have a matrix for which the LD, LD decomposition does not exist? Okay. Um, so if we consider the main step. All right. So you didn't miss much. <laughs> uh, Gaussian elimination. Uh, so I'll just reproduce that from the algorithm. That. Um, okay. A I K is equal to itself minus the multiplier. Times a j k. 
All right. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put in some superscripts. Um, so for AIK and AJK, oh wait, that should be a J, not a K. All right, so the superscript means after you've carried out elimination in columns one through J, th these are the entries that you have. Now, you're, you're overriding A um, as you perform row operations, um, but I just want to make clear like which is the old and which is the new. So when we update AIK, Um, then, so so this is the the new entry uh, that we get. Um, okay. All right. Where a one is the original matrix. Um, so in other words, after I work on all the entries in the first column, eliminate those, then that'll be the entries of A2 and so on. Okay. Now, um, so, all, so all of these entries with whatever subscripts and superscripts have some round off error in them. Um, uh, so another way of putting it is AJK J, sorry, I've got my subscripts in the wrong order. Okay. Um, is really equal to equal to one plus some error where this quantity, whoops, tilde AJKJ, that's a mouthful, is a uh, result of performing Gaussian elimination in exact arithmetic. So if you were to be able to carry out gas elimination with no round off error whatsoever, you had infinitely many decimal places, um, then this is the value that you would get, um, but this is the value that you actually do get when you carry this out like in MATLAB. Um, so there's going to be some um, error. So, stupid thing. So epsilon is the uh, round off error. And I say relative because because of its one plus the error. Um, so you can think of it as being like a percentage error. Okay. Now Suppose a multiplier mij is large. Then the round off error in ajkj is amplified by this multiplier. So then the new entry ajkj plus 1 will have a, have a greater degree of round-off error in it because of its amplification. Um, so, so that is why 
um, it actually behooves us to, to carry out row operations. So, so even if there's no danger of dividing by zero, we should interchange rows. In other words, pivot um, to uh, reduce the size of these multipliers. So for instance, suppose we can ensure that the multipliers are uh, less than or equal to 1 in absolute value. Then whatever round off error from this entry is not amplified at all, or maybe even reduced um, in computing uh, this entry. Now there's still other round off error that's being introduced, like uh, carrying out the subtraction, for instance. Um, so now and the thing is, um, Keeping uh, multipliers uh, small helps with the original purpose of row interchanges because we want to avoid dividing by zero. Um, so what happens is uh, dividing by zero, that's really an instance of a multiplier being infinitely large. So if we perform row interchanges to ensure small multipliers, then that problem is naturally done away with. Okay. <clears throat> um, so if we keep my have multipliers defined, that mij is equal to aij over ajj, we want to perform an interchange among these rows, j, j plus 1, etc down to row n. So we're only going to consider, uh, we're only going to examine these rows um, so that um, a j j is as large as possible. So in other words, suppose you're about to work on column j and you can't because a j j is zero. So you have to perform a row interchange. Well, this will take care of that. So we're going to look at all the entries in column J from a diagonal on down, find the largest one, and move that uh, to the diagonal position. So then you will not be dividing by zero. Um, and that leads to what is called partial pivoting. Okay. So in partial pivoting, um, we examine these entries. A J J, A J plus one J, A J plus two J, and so on, all the way down to A N J, and find the largest, an absolute value, of course. Only magnitude matters here. Um, okay, so so suppose that entry is A Q J. So in other words. We look through all these rows from j, j plus 1, all the way down to n, and we found the largest one in row q. Then we interchange row j and row q. So this ensures the smallest multipliers uh, possible. from entries in column J at least. Um, and if there are ways to make multipliers smaller than that, but that, that's what complete pivoting is. I'll talk about that, well, I think, on Wednesday. Um, OK. So that's the idea behind uh, partial pivoting, that we um, look at that portion of a column, um, find the largest, swap accordingly uh, to, to move the largest element into the diagonal position. Um, so it guarantees. that the multiplier mij is less than or equal to 1. Okay. Um, so that helps reduce the spread of uh, uh, round off error. All right. Um, 
Okay. Um, also, it's efficient because you're performing on the order of n squared comparisons, which is rel relatively negligible compared to the order n cubed arithmetic operations that you're already going to be performing. So within each column, you're comparing um, entries within that column. So you're looking at n entries of first column, n minus 1 entries of second column, and so forth. It adds up to order n squared. Uh, but um, each individual comparison uh, is, is not much work. Um, it's you know, less, than, less than the work of a flop. Um, so this doesn't add much overhead. So, so that's a nice aspect of uh, partial pivoting. Um, so the backslash operator in MATLAB um, and because some people get this confused I notice that's the backslash, the slash going that way um, <clears throat> okay um, so that um, okay. Something weird's going on here. I don't want to be in italics. Okay. It's almost like it could be in the math mode or something. It's kind of strange. Okay. So that performs Gaussian elimination. Uh, with partial pivoting. Uh, so it's kind of like the the most commonly um, uh, used method for Gauss, for counting gas elimination. There are other pivoting schemes out there. I'll talk about you know one of them in a section, but uh, generally it's partial pivoting is what you use because it, it work, it's very effective for reducing the size of multipliers and also uh, um, uh, and therefore. Uh, containing the uh, sp spread of round off error, and it's fairly efficient. Um, however, even with small multipliers, the entries of U can still get very large. Um, generally, no. Um, uh, So there's a homework problem in a section uh, where uh, this is illustrated. Um, and we don't like to have very large entries in U because that also can lead to spread of round off error in later stages like back substitution and so forth. Um, so, for, so partial pivoting doesn't always uh, perform as advertised, but, um, but it's, it's something that's, that certainly helps. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Any other comments we need to make about partial pivoting? No. Um, okay. Now, um, the last thing I want to mention in the first three minutes, if we look at this uh, main step, and this is something I actually meant to cover in a previous class and I forgot. Notice we have M, I, J, A, J, K. The second index here matches the uh, first index of the element we're multiplying, which is something you see from matrix, matrix multiplication, the general formula uh, for it. Um, and if I go ahead and pull that up, uh, I mentioned before that there's an appendix in the back of a book for um, review of linear algebra. Um, 
Okay, and if we look at the section on um, matrix multiplication um, and mat so um, so like here, this is a formula for matrix vector multiplication. I'm multiplying a times x, and I take the ith entry, and we have this here. Um, and then there's also the so that's a special case of matrix matrix multiplication. Um, okay. Um, here I bring these up because these are formulas that are good to have off the top of your head. Um, that there's so many problems where these kind of formulas come up, these these specific ones, and you um, and, and notice here the same kind of thing. We have the second index of this entry matches the first index of this entry um, in a matrix matrix product. Um, so um, and that's also apparent in the matrix vector product formula too. Um, that I, I find myself needing this formula for uh, working out quite a few problems, especially you know things that are worked out on paper, for instance. Um, and I, like I imagine if well, hopefully, if I were to give you a couple of matrices, say multiply them, you know what to do, uh, just intuitively. But also, to having the formula in your head uh, is something that could be uh, uh, very helpful. Okay, um, I believe I am out of time now. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so I will wrap up this section um, on Wednesday.